One of the most frequently asked questions that I get as a quail specialist is from somebody typically east of Highway 83, the 100th Meridian, and they're saying, we used to have quail everywhere. I used to go out and hunt them with my 410 after school, weedy fence row, get my limit. Now there are no quail uh, really in that part of the state. So the question is, how? what options do I have for trying to restock my property with quail? That's like asking for the holy grail of quail management. We just don't have a great answer for being able to restore populations further east. Now, a lot of things going on right now, uh, including habitat uh, improvements and trying to make that landscape as friendly as quail. So you basically have two schools of thought. One is, if you build it, they will come. So if we work and we improve our habitat, and, and we improve the habitat around us, again, because we're typically talking about uh, smaller property owners. So if we can make a large enough footprint of quail habitat, usable space on the landscape, and again, we think that uh, is the neighborhood of 2,000 acres or more, that the quail will repopulate that area. Now, the fallacy in that, or possible fallacy, is there might not be any quail in that area to serve as fuel to restart that fire. So that's one of the biggest concerns and frequently asked questions we have. So I'm gonna address that in two respects today. The first is through some type of artificial release method using pin-reared quail. And the second is with some research that we're currently doing on the translocation of wild trap quail to points further east. Let's talk about the pin-reared quail question, farm-reared quail, whatever you wanna call it. I can't tell you how many people well, uh, and this is going to be controversial because when I tell you it won't work, somebody's going to email me and say, well, and I'm an exception to that and I've had luck with it. The odds of jump-starting an otherwise dormant quail population by using pin reared quail is slim and none. Uh, we've tried it every different way that you can. If there's one universal truth in quail management is that it probably ain't going to work. So uh, there's several reasons for that. One is your typical pin raised quail has some just weak links. One is it's probably overweight. A wild quail will weigh about 170 grams. Pin raised quail sometimes weigh 200 or more grams. They're couch potatoes. And when you ask them to go out and be able to survive all the various rigors that they're going to face in the wild, they're not adapted to that. They can't fly as fast. They uh, don't have any savvy. Uh, they don't have the street savvy of being able to learn from their conspecifics, from their other covey mates that know what to do when this, quail, when this hawk is circling overhead or when it's being approached by this bobcat. So they're just dumb and as a result they take a hit in terms of predation. If you started out with a thousand pin raised quail, probably by 30 days you're going to be down to less than a hundred. That just that rate of mortality. So some of those birds may survive, indeed some of them may reproduce. But by and large, it's going to be a very, very low return on investment. Now, people will argue and say, well, I've used this type of device or this Johnny house, and I'm getting my birds from a breeder that's raised those birds in isolation. All those may have a little bit of impact. None of them have proven to be very successful in jump-starting a quail population. Now, here at the quail, Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch, over the last five years, we've been tackling that question with an, in another way. We want to know, can we catch wild trapped birds from points that still have decent quail populations, like here in Fisher County where we're at the Quail Research Ranch, places a little further west of here, and can we take those wild trapped birds, experimentally move them to these sites back further east, and hope that, that they will take a hold, get a foothold, and then start as a breeding population over there. We've had some successes, we've had some failures, and we're still working on that, trying to determine what that best equation is and where are weak links and so forth. Uh, we have a new study that will be starting in uh, April of 2019 in Erath County. Strategically, it's important for us to be able to show that we can take quail from out here on the western front and move them back eastern and, and reclaim some of that country that heretofore was good quail populations and good quail habitat, but now it's not. And it's important that we can show some successes because those landowners, if we've got a landowner that we can show that we translocated these wild trap quail in, and then all of a sudden the neighbors are beginning to hear quail or see quail, that's a real motivator. And so there when we talk about 
making that footprint on the landscape larger by having good quail habitat now we've got an attentive audience. So there's several things we're trying to accomplish with this translocation of wild trap quail. We've kind of hybridized the, the, no pun intended, the pen rear quail situation and the wild trap quail by using these types of devices that I'm sitting on. These are called surrogators. They're commercially sold and, and the desire is to put uh, three day old chicks in there and release them at five weeks of age to have a wilder quail. Uh, they haven't proved to be too successful in that. We're not using them in that context. We're using these, we catch, we have these uh, on a site, let's say in Erath County, in good quail habitat. We're gonna catch 25 wild trap quail, put them in here about April 1st, and we're going to sequester those birds. They're in this, they're predator proofed. We're gonna leave them in this, giving them access to a layer ration and keeping them protected from the predators during that time. We want them to have 30 days to kind of acclimate to that area. And then on about the 1st of May, which we consider the start of nesting season, we're gonna open the door and release those birds. We've done a couple of things for them. One is we've predator-proofed them. So the varmints may up here, be up here around at night, but they're having an opportunity to acclimate that without being fear of, of being killed. Second thing is We've allowed them in, in, in any what I call con specifics, members of the Bob Whites that are resident birds, but at a very low level, those birds are talking back and forth to them. So we think that when we release these birds on May 1, then the site fidelity, the number of birds that stay on site is higher than if there were absolutely no birds present on the landscape. So those are some of the things that we're researching and we'll put radio collars on the hens follow those birds uh, during the nesting season to see if we can document nesting, see if we can document survival, how many of the birds disperse off the site. Uh, in our previous work with Bob Whites, it's been a fairly good site fidelity. Uh, probably less than 20% of them uh, move over three miles. So we feel pretty good about being able to put those birds there and they call it home if it's good quail habitat. So continue to follow us on our Facebook page and then with our eQuail newsletter, and we'll keep you up to, up to date on what the status of these wild bird translocations are, and hopefully that's going to provide us an opportunity and a future for restoring quail populations on some of these landscapes further east. Now, if you're one of these small acreage landowners, and, and the typical land holding in the state of Texas is less than 20 acres, much bigger in West Texas, smaller in East Texas, and that causes some problems as we've discussed in another webisode about how that impacts quail, that whole idea of habitat fragmentation. So what are some specific practices you can do to help build it and hope that they come? Well first is you can become what I call a student of quail. Uh, learn all you can about quail. What are the weak links? What does my habitat not have quail when areas further west do? What is it that's missing? A lot of people say nothing's changed on my property. Rarely is that the case. Get on Google Earth, zoom in on your property, and then zoom out and see how that landscape changes. Odds are you're surrounded by a lot more exotic pastures, coastal Bermuda grass, that kind of thing. That's not quail habitat, and that's changed a lot over the last 30 years. So one of the things you can do is, as you're contemplating vegetation changes or pasture management, Try to go with something that's more quail friendly, a native warm season grass, something with a little blue stem, Sados grama, Indian grass, some of these native grasses as opposed to the exotic grasses. You're gonna have, probably have to reduce your stocking rate. Uh, a lot of the country east of us, because of those exotic pastures, Bermuda grass, they've been used to running a cow to two acres. In a native range situation, you're probably going to decrease that by anywhere from 5 to 20 fold. Native pasture just can't take that kind of stocking rate. So you're going to probably have to cut your stocking rate of cattle, and that may be a real difficult pill for a lot of people to swallow. Back in the 70s, there used to be a saying from the Earth Movement about act locally, think globally. In other words, do the best you can on that little small parcel of your land, but think about how it's going to impact or could impact the bigger landscape. Same principle applies here. Do the best with what you've got, whether it's 10 acres or 100 acres. Try to make it a showcase for quail habitat. And then, again, by the fact that your neighbors are watching you, they're always watching. And if you can document either through natural immigration that you have birds coming in there, the build that you built that they will come, 
or through some of these translocation processes, we can establish a quail population, we can restore that quail population, then we'll begin to win the attention and the favor of our neighbors and hopefully build that whole quail friendly landscape. Now keep in mind when I say translocating wild trap birds, this is all experimental at this point. We have special permits that allow us to trap and move those birds. If and as we can prove that this is successful, there is a permit on the books with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, commonly called the Triple T, that would allow landowners to do that. But our situation is we've got to be able to document that the translocation of wild trap birds is indeed a viable tool for restoring those quail populations. Nationally, it's a very, very hot topic right now, and we're doing our part here in Texas to see if we can move those wild trap birds over and then have a sustainable population five years after we translocate. That's the bar that we've got to reach in order for Parks and Wildlife to say that's a successful technique. So stay with us, uh, stay tuned, and we're working hard to try to achieve that.